Good evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's event. I'm Dr. Jacob Reneker, scholar in residence for the John A. Woodso Foundation and the host for this Come Follow Me Interfaith Conversation Series. Uh, one of the primary goals of the Woodso Foundation is to inspire members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to engage in meaningful interfaith dialogue and community outreach in order to strengthen our local communities around the world. So for our conversation this evening, we're going to talk about the Passover uh, from a Jewish perspective. We invite uh, each of you uh, watching uh, at home or wherever you may be uh, to join in the conversation by asking us your questions at any time during this event using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So inside that Q&A window, you'll uh, be able to see what questions other folks have been asking, and you can vote for questions that you yourself would like answered as well. So we'll try to start answering our questions around the 40 minute mark of our conversation. Um, and we wanna get to as many questions as we can, but um, likely we will not be able to. Um, you can also uh, make, your, make comments and engage with other uh, audience members using the chat feature, which is uh, enabled now. Um, on your Zoom screen. So uh, please be sure to use the comment uh, and chat feature for comments, thoughts, and engaging um, and reserving your questions uh, for the Q&A window. That will help us to get through those uh, quickly and more effectively. Um, and finally, uh, you can find video replays of all our events along with links to podcast recordings uh, of this Interfaith Conversation series, uh, including tonight's event, at woodsofoundation.org. So enough of that uh, long-winded introduction. Uh, I'll give you another long-winded introduction, but this one's worthwhile because I'm going to be introducing our guest tonight. That's uh, Rabbi Robert A. Harris. Um, so uh, Rabbi Harris is professor of Bible and ancient Semitic languages at the Jewish Theological Seminary, teaching courses in biblical literature and commentary. Rabbi Harris also lectures on biblical narrative and Jewish liturgy in congregations and adult education institutes around the country and frequently lectures about Passover. So he's well versed in this and used to talking uh, in great detail about the Passover itself. We're very fortunate to have him. Um, Rab uh, rabbi Harris has served as a rabbi in several congregations in the United States and Israel, uh, including the Pelham uh, Jewish Center in Westchester County, New York and the Moriah Synagogue in Haifa, Israel. Rabbi Harris has continued to, uh, his love for congregational work for the past 20 years by serving Temple uh, Beit Shalom in Cambridge, Massachusetts on the High Holy Days and frequently visits there during the year as well. So Rabbi Harris, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's a, as I said before, it's a pleasure for you to meet me. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation, Jacob. Great. So to, to start out, let's, um, I thought it'd be great for you to kind of give us a kind of quick summary, kind of getting us up to speed. We're, we're going to be spending most of our time in Exodus 12 and 13, the Passover, as it's first described kind of chronologically in the, the biblical sure. text there. Um, so before we kind of get to that, why don't you give us a kind of quick recap of what's happening there with, with Moses and how we get to- You know, when, um, when people ask me that, I, I usually break out uh, uh, into song, the old Negro spiritual, when Israel was in Egypt land, because that's how the book of Exodus begins, of course, with a story of uh, slavery and near genocide and uh, pretty horrible uh, uh, circumstances, all summarized in a, a precious few verses. The Bible is really not that interested in slavery per se, but in the redemption from slavery. And much of the rest of the book up until the Exodus itself, about Exodus chapter 15, if you're scoring at home, the, is, um, is really the story of how God brings Israel out of Egypt. Um, the, the commandments to observe the Passover are given in a kind of an anticipation of their departure. So the, the, the key text is, of course, Exodus chapter 12, but the Israelites don't actually leave Egypt for another three chapters of the Torah in Exodus 15. And um, I like to say that there is also a recapitulation of uh, Exodus 12 in Deuteronomy 16. So I encourage all uh, of our participants to uh, consider those texts also, the first eight verses of the chapter in particular, because they provide a different perspective of what happened in Exodus 12. And in fact, 
much of the continuing discourse about Passover, both in the Bible and post-biblically in rabbinic literature, are due to a really the dialectic or the discussion or the argument even between those two passages, Exodus 12 and Deuteronomy 16. Okay, hey, great. So yeah, why don't you kind of outline some of what those sure. differences are? I think the audience uh, in particular, so um, the you know Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints members across the world are going to be talking about this uh, in the next and studying about this themselves, uh, but focusing on Exodus, you know, 12, 13, kind of sure. 8 before that. So that kind of block there up to leading up to their uh, exit. Um, so that's where they're going to be most familiar with. So maybe you can help highlight some of those differences. Absolutely. Having to do with Exodus 12 is kind of, you know, our, 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 the key our, our text, touchstone yeah. there for the difference. So the Passover in Exodus 12, as I'm sure your, your readers have already seen, is done without a priesthood. There's no temple or sanctuary. You basically, you're talking about a Passover sacrifice in somebody's backyard kind of thing. Um, you, you are uh, offering either a lamb or a goat. It must be wholly roasted. That's W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly roasted. And specifically it says, do not boil it. And that, that commandment is already indicating to you that Exodus 12 does not see this as a temple sacrifice because temple sacrifice meat was boiled, in fact. So when you get to Deuteronomy, they're talking about, uh, it's a different Hebrew verb, vishaltai, you shall boil it, right? Moreover, whereas it's in, uh, in Exodus 12, is again, it's, it's in your home with your family, in Deuteronomy 16, it is in the temple. Um, uh, it's even a different time of the month. Uh, in Exodus chapter 12, you're, you're specifically commanded to get that goat or that lamb and slaughter it at twilight on the 14th of the month as you move into the 15th. And in Deuteronomy 16, it says Bechodesh, which there means not the month of, but the new moon of. Uh, so it's two weeks earlier in the month. So basically in every particular that you can imagine, there is a difference between the two. And the key difference is that Deuteronomy also enables you to offer a cow instead of a uh, lamb or a goat. And that key uh, element uh, leads me to one of my first sessions when I teach this in a series of weeks, um, the cow that laid an egg, because the cow of, of Deuteronomy ends up as an egg uh, at our Seder plate, which is itself a wonderful story, which would only take me about an hour and a half to tell you how it gets there, but we'll, we'll skip that for now. So in terms of um, you know, Jewish interpreters over the years, uh, recognizing or, you know, those differences, uh, how did they kind of reconcile those or what, what was their approach to taking you know, seriously and honestly what's, sure. what's happening in Exodus 12, Deuteronomy 16? How did they kind of work, work through that? Well, it's, an, it's really an interesting question because the interpretive process, process begins in the Bible itself. Some of you uh, may know the story of King Josiah towards the end of the, um, the Iron Age, you know, um, uh, think the year 600 BCE. Um, he, uh, finding a scroll of the Torah in the temple during a repair, which basically is Deuteronomy, um, uh, celebrates the Passover according to Deuteronomy, not really so much according to Exodus 12. By the time you get to the very end of Hebrew scriptures, Second Chronicles, and if you're looking for a really good read, the book of Chronicles is probably not where you're headed. But at any rate, in uh, two Chronicles, uh, either 34 or 35, um, they offer the, the first reconciliation clearly between those two texts because they, they say, ah, in Exodus 12, we're talking about a lamb or a goat. That must be the Passover offering. There must be a second offering, and that's the cow. Um, and uh, that one's boiled just like all the other temple sacrifices were boiled. And so right there in, uh, I'm gonna say uh, about verse 18 of that chapter, you'll see a reconciliation and it's a funny reconciliation. It says, you should roast the Passover offering in water. <laughs> or no, no, you, I'm, excuse me, the inverse. You should boil it in fire. I'm sorry, it says you should boil it in fire. I'm trying to translate from the Hebrew. You should boil it in fire, which of course doesn't mean anything. And out of, out of those, conflicts in scriptural witness, the rabbis really go to town in trying to work out um, a, a practice that makes sense in light of both passages. 
That's yeah, that's great. Um, so, uh, do you have examples that kind of come to mind about the kind of debate or discussion about how to reconcile those? You know, after the fact, right? You know, outside of the Bible, right? In as as, sure. as Jewish, uh, you know, community is having to deal with this text sure. in changing times. How, how are they? How are they reconciling that? So between the first century and the second century, put differently in terms of Christian tradition, from the life of Jesus in the first century until the foundation of the church in the second century, when all that is going on, the rabbis are also kind of trying to reorganize things. And it doesn't happen on like a Tuesday in the month of February in the year 71 or 116. It takes a long time for these kinds of things to get um, uh, set in place. The, the text that embodies most of those early uh, conversations and evolutions is called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is published in the third century or thereabouts. So again, a Christian analogy might be a little bit later, the Nicene Creed, where your people are trying to decide really what is, you know, uh, I almost said kosher Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, as opposed to uh, heretical trends in early Christianity. So the rabbis in the Mishnah recognize these changes that have evolved in the Bible itself because the Bible goes on for, oh, I don't know, at least five, six, seven hundred years on this story between the Exodus and the time of the destruction of the, the first temple. They've got to figure out how to deal with this because they're trying to create a ceremony or a ritual that will make sense to post-temple Judaism, right? So what um, you and I had had this conversation a few weeks ago, in the first century, while the temple is still standing, rabbis are still arguing about that Passover sacrifice, the sacrificing the goat, the adding of the cow in the temple, and having that Paschal meal in the, the sacred precincts in Jerusalem. Jesus is alive during all that, right? Post-temple destruction, there's no more sacrifice, right? We don't have that anymore. So what they do is essentially building on a Roman or a Greco-Roman uh, custom, which we'll talk about later, called the symposium. They're going to create a sacred meal at which these various rituals and texts could be discussed. And instead of focusing on the temple sacrifice, which is no longer in existence, they start focusing on the narrative. And that's why the Seder that Jews have in post destructive times, all down to this very day, is rooted in how do you tell a story? How do you sing around a story? How do you argue about the meaning of a story? How do you teach it to young people and at the same time have a, dis a discourse that makes sense to older people? And that ritual we call the Seder. That's great. So all that really happens, uh, uh, the first time you see it is in the Mishnah, third century. So between I don't know, you want to call the year zero and the third century is hundreds of years already before we really see it kind of, I would say, set in stone, but it's probably more like in parchment. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, so I want to just kind of step back for, for a minute sure. on the, um, you know, the, the reconciling differences or right, the, the Bible itself you know, with Chronicles kind of trying to sure. reconcile Deuteronomy and, uh, and Exodus. Um, and then kind of after that, the other, you know, interpreters, preservers of the tradition, uh, having to recognize all of those different, right, different approaches, different words uh, about uh, and instructions about the text uh, itself and the, the, the ritual, right, how are you supposed to observe that? So um, in, right, so in, in Christian tradition, uh, largely speaking, and in the, um, the tradition of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the you know sometimes there's a tendency to see the Bible or Scripture uh, as kind of a kind of comprehensive monolithic whole that God sure. you know kind of just kind of downloaded uh, into you know prophetic writers or whatever and they just or or that it just was you know kind of divine fax machine and just kind of came out um, sure. and it was all there just courtesy of God um, but so once people recognize that there are differences between some of these different books within a, you know, a collection of scripture. Um, some people struggle with that themselves, right? So they still um, do. Yeah, right. No, absolutely. So, so within the Jewish community, I'd love to hear a bit about, uh, you know, the Jewish community's, you know, historical approaches and even, you know, the, the tradition of the approach to scriptures within, you know, the, the collection, the canon of, of, of sure. scripture. 
how, how do how do, do people in the Jewish community typically approach these clear differences in the text itself? It's a great question. Um, I should probably pull a book off my shelves and hold it up the screen, but I won't run to do that. Um, if you look at a typical rabbinic Bible, and maybe Jacob, afterwards we can post a, a, a photograph, it, the, the, the Hebrew text is placed in the middle and surrounding the text are commentaries. And people think, well, there, there are all those Jewish rabbis are interpreting the text, they must be saying the same thing. But you read the commentaries and they're vociferously arguing throughout the Middle Ages and into modernity about the meaning of the text. So just to take your example, uh, one particular commentator, uh, Moshe ben Nachman in uh, the 14th century Christian Spain, he said Moses functioned like a copyist. He merely copied the primordial Torah that God had disclosed to him, and there was no creative function whatsoever. Yet an earlier rabbi, very prominent also, opposite this fellow on the page, is saying, no, 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 Moses was a prophet of God. He, of course, accurately recorded the words of God, but the book, Moses wrote the book. He wrote it right there in, you know, when the Israelites were in Egypt. He wrote it scroll by scroll during the 14, excuse me, 40 years of the wandering. So you couldn't have had a more dramatic difference than the role of what, it, what does it mean to be a prophet and to record God's, you know, God's words. Um, one is very passive and one is very creative. So, um, if that's true about the Torah as a whole, it is certainly true about the Exodus tradition and the Seder. So um, to get to your, your specific point, the kinds of questions that we are debating now that are first embodied between Exodus 12 and Deuteronomy 16 are right there in the 10th chapter of the Mishnah on Passover, where they're basically creating what we call the Seder which again, is not a biblical meal. That's the Paschal slaughter, right? But once they stop doing that, they create the Seder post-destruction. There are two Mishnayot, two Mishnas that argue one with the other. If you're looking it up later, it's 10-4 versus 10-5. We can all remember 10-4, can't we? Um, Roger. So the, the, the one Mishnah basically says, no, we have to think specifically about the Passover offering and how it was done and try to somehow recreate that in our own table. The other one, again, from the second century post temple, he says, wait, we can't do that anymore. We might not have the ingredients. We might not have the food. Let's instead create a ritual through which he says, every person must look upon him or herself as though he or she personally went forth from Egypt. And you do that through chanting, through asking questions, through uh, debating and discussing how it means. The rules there are pretty fascinating and they work for any educator. One rule there in the 10th chapter there says, according to the capacity of the child to understand, comma, so should the parent instruct that child. And that gives rise to the, well, there are four four types of children, four types of students. Uh, obviously, there are many more than four, but the idea is each person has to have the capacity to understand it in his or her own way. Or they'll say, well, Passover night, you got to tell the story of Passover. Okay, but where do I begin the story? One guy says, well, begin it in Exodus chapter one. And somebody else says, begin it in, in uh, Genesis chapter, chapter 12, when the ancestors of the Israelites were idolaters. You know, and somebody else says, wait a minute, it's only one night. We're going to read all those chapters. We'll never finish. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 26. Let's look at these three or four verses. If you can look it up, it's Deuteronomy uh, 26 verses five through seven. Look up these three verses and, and, and just chat about those three verses. That would be enough, right? So there's all sorts of answers and they all work themselves into the Passover Seder. That's yeah. That, that's that, that's that's really interesting. So that's so it's kind of putting the emphasis on kind of the individual as experiencing this. This is kind of recapitulating. Kind yes, of it's a reenactment in some sort of way personally what happened there scripturally. And by the way, it's true of every person that sits at a seder. So um, you know, we always we try to invite. Uh, our Christian neighbors, we invite uh, neighbors who are Jewish but don't think the way we do. We want a lively debate at the 
at the table. But whatever the debate is, each person at that table must feel as though he or she has, by the end, experienced some of that redemption. That's great. I, I like that idea. I think that's beautiful, right? This kind of experiential, uh, yeah, um, kind of engagement with scriptures. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and, and, and the fact that there's, uh, you know, a, a discussion debate, not just, you know, discussion, I think uh, there's certainly in certain, you know, cultures, uh, an emphasis on kind of harmony, unity, right, and shying away from debate, disagreement. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so but this is God, see, God loves discordant harmony, 12 tone harmony, I that's the only way I can think of it. Because if if God, you know, uh, you open up the page of the Talmud, any page of the Talmud, which is the core rabbinic text, there's arguments about everything on every page, right? And the general rabbinic rule is Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. Both these and those are the words of the living God, right? All I've just been pointing out is that those differences exist in scripture itself. So if Deuteronomy is duking it out against Exodus and you know, Second Kings, you know, 22 or 23 has a different idea about the Exodus than they did. And then it's reinterpreted in Chronicles. I got to think that God loves discordant harmony. And how much the more so when you have the, the Church of, of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and you're disagreeing maybe with a lot of particulars, let's say, with the Catholic Church, let alone with Buddhist, Muslims, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hindus. Uh, oh, yeah. Or oh, the Jews also. If God, God's own great self, can't see the entirety of his world, which we see as a cacophony, as something beautiful, then then I, I would have to change my imagination of what God means. God must love the disagreement and somehow take divine pleasure in that. That's uh, that, I really like that approach. I think, yeah, that kind of short circuits the question. Uh, but which which was right, right? So if, if yeah, the the question is, so is, is, is it Exodus 12 or is it Deuteronomy 16 or is it Second Chronicles or is it or was it Rabbi So so I think there's at least in, in, in certain cultures uh, and you know religious uh, you know um, cultural uh, a, a really need for uh, clarity, right? And a definitive mm -hmm. answer of right or wrong or which. And so this is a I think a refreshing, interesting way of. Uh, approaching that question when you do have disagreements, not just within the scriptural text itself, but sometimes in individuals, you know, how they are interpreting it, um, kind of filtering it themselves and what it means to them to have these people in a room talking about the same, right, the, the same sure. event, essentially, but not having the same experience, not having the same uh, interpretation or even, you know, ethical framework for how to make sense of what's happening there, but that there can still be beauty uh in that or something positive something meaningful can, can can be generated in that sort of discussion and not just mm -hmm. recognizing that there is a victor <laughs> somebody's right. won the conversation or this person was right in that one so that's a, a kind of a different approach and so i want to kind of ask you another question follow up on something you mentioned earlier about uh the kind of shift post destruction of the temple right so when when the temple was established then you have kind of the shift um, you mentioned in uh, uh, with King Josiah, right, with the Deuteronomistic kind of reform, uh, right. and and worship is kind of is really there centralized in at the Jerusalem Temple, right? So, um, so that that year, so six hundred ish um, BCE, so interesting for for Latter Day Saints. That's about the same time that uh, their you know prophetic figures. Uh, are recorded in the Book of Mormon as kind of oh, leaving, I, just kind of just just prior to Babylonian uh, captivity exactly. uh, description. So that's so really interesting kind of time period uh, for of interest for Latter Day Saints, and hopefully as they're discussing Josiah and what's happening there, that that'll seem relevant. I think in light of this conversation that we're having now, a little bit later in another um, another few months. So. Um, but there's a shift, right? So the, the Passover meal from being, in, you said, in people's backyards, essentially, right? Kind of Exodus 12, this kind of each person um, doing this kind of individually as family. And then that kind of being transferred focus at the temple itself. 
uh, and having the priesthood as being kind of the you know officiators, mediators of this kind of uh, this this liturgical this ritual experience. And then after the destruction of the temple, then kind of a question of how, how do we make sense of this when it was then rooted in this temple um, institution? Um, you said that there was a shift from kind of an emphasis on the ritual itself to the narrative. And uh, so I'd, I'd love for you to hear to, to speak a little bit to that on, on what you see um, as the maybe the advantages or you know the 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 happy uh, you know, Kind of consequences of the destruction of the temple requiring a change in the a, a, a silver lining of a very dark cloud uh yes, yes. just to clarify uh jacob um that shift is at the destruction of the second temple in the right, year right, right. yeah yeah yep, yep, exactly. so that um we don't actually understand that much about what happened uh during the babylonian exile we we know things that happened at the end of it but um, uh, not so much about the inner workings, let's say, of the Passover festival um, uh, in, you know, the 400 or the 300. But we do see it later on, uh, again, as the Roman period, uh, you know, enters, you know it, it has its own impact on, on Judah, on the, the, the Jews in the land of Israel. Um, once that, dis that destruction takes place, in theory, Jews could have said, okay, let's go back to the old way of sacrificing in our backyard. Apparently, some Jews thought that would be a good idea, but eventually, again, over a period of a few hundred years, that ended. There was no more sacrifice. Uh, you might know about the Samaritans. They continued to do a Passover sacrifice in the north of Israel, but uh, they ended up, excuse me, being a minority. And the, the Jews decided to study text. Right, we see this in a, 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 a parallel midrash or, or interpretive text between the first century and the second century. You know, the, the rabbis who gathered on the, the eve of Passover and you know discussed and probed all night. That's the the setting. In the first century, they were talking about um, how to um, how to observe that the Paschal sacrifice. By the second century, again, it's really telling the story of the Exodus. So stories are powerful things. So to answer your question, you know, when we when we create rituals or we create experiences, think, um, for example, of a child and uh, her caregiver before bedtime, right? How many of us as parents read to our children or how many remember being read to? And in the reading, there's warmth and there's security even before a child knows how to decode, that is to say, read a text on his or her own. There's a, there's a trust and there's a, you know, and then again, if what happens in your family was anything like what happened in my family, sometimes the kids then get involved in it. They ask questions. I mean, um, uh, transfer that to a completely secular um, uh, 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 ritual. For years, uh, my wife and my daughters and I would, um, we, we let our kids watch one show a day when they were little, and they, they always chose to look at Full House. It was a half an hour rerun at 5.30, six o'clock when the four of us would sit down to eat, and we talked about Full House. And we talked about the problems that were going on and the kids volunteered their own thing and who they liked. And it was an event so that when Danny Tanner died tragically a few months ago, right? Um, my, my daughters and their family, and we all kind of relived it. It was powerful memory. So how much the more so if the memory was Avadim Hayinu Lefaru B'Mitzrayim, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Now, it's not, as part of the Seder, it's not they were slaves or those ancient Israelites, they were slaves. It is drummed into you. We were slaves. And were God not to have freed our ancestors, then we and our children and our children's children would still be slaves. That's the narrative that we recount on the eve of Passover at the Seder. That's a powerful thing, right? And we chant it and we sing it and we were frankly a little bit of afraid of it, right? Oh my God, we just, just by that much, we could also be slaves. And then it surely sensitizes you to anybody in the world that you live in who's downtrodden, right? 
oh my gosh, whether it's people who are suffering in this country or a, or a foreign country, um, that, you know, um, our hearts go out to them because we know what it was like. We have this institutional memory that's been drummed into us every year, by the way, every day, but every year we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, the, the the kind of, yeah, again, that kind of like participatory nature of stories that kind of invites us to do that. And I loved your mm -hmm. example of, you know, children at bedtime. I, my my son is, is celebrating his second birthday today right now. Oh, so wonderful. I'm being negligent as a parent and ignoring him on his birthday. Uh, but it's but just, just kind of thinking about the through, there's always before bed, yeah, a, a story and a, and a song, right? And so there's kind of like, and it's like he knows that and it's comfortable and is engaging with that and is picking the song and that sort of thing. So seeing that framework kind of repeated in a you know religious religiously significant way i think yeah that that's something that is 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 powerful and can help shape not just by the you know, way the, i think i think jacob if i can if i can interject the yeah. the, in, the the ritual of reading scriptures to a community which both jews and christians do and muslims too as far as i know the ritual is a kind of a reenactment of that moment because whoever is up there on the dais reading is in a sense representing God, the ultimate parent, right? And we in the congregation who are hearing scripture chanted or read, whatever your tradition is, we are the child. I know how to read, I don't need to be read to, but there's <laughs> something powerful about, you know, by the bear Adonai El Moshe Lemor, having that, that chant, you know, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, it is right then. It's like God, you're on Mount Sinai once again, here in the scriptures read from the mouth of God through the hand of, uh, you know, agency of Moses. I think that that reenactment works in so many ways. That's great. And I think the closest analog in uh, Latter-day Saint practice uh, is a uh, temple, Latter-day Saint temple ceremonies where there's a kind of, you know, liturgical, you know, religious, you know, ritual um, kind of recapitulating the creation of the world, Garden of Eden. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's kind of rather than the Exodus as kind of the founding narrative, it's providing this where, uh, you know, members of the church who are participating are becoming, you know, they're kind of stepping into that. Again, like you're saying, like we were slaves in Israel. It's we were, you know, we are Adam, we are Eve, and kind of trying to inhabit that scriptural story rather than just kind of, you know, examine it obje objectively from the outside so that yeah. there's something that really isn't within the latter-day saint tradition that is transformative and powerful that the, the people find meaningful and life-giving in their lives so i think that's a really interesting kind of commonality between our two traditions. and now it's it's funny though when you think about it i often say this to my introductory bible students i'll ask them what did god do in the bible right and very often the very first thing they'll say is god created the world or god created the universe right and I said, okay, and what else? And the other students, the next favorite answer is that God gave us the Torah, you know, Mount Sinai, right? And I said, it's very interesting. And then if you look at the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible, I'll say to them, outside of Genesis chapter one, creation is a rather minor theme for Jews. I'm just talking about it. It's, it's mentioned hardly at all. Giving the Torah, Sometimes it's even skipped. I, I mentioned earlier the focus on Deuteronomy 26 as a vehicle through which to tell the Passover story. It ain't there. It's skipped over. They go right from the Exodus into the land of Israel. No given to the Torah. And then I say, drum roll moment. What is the real theme of the Hebrew Bible mentioned hundreds and hundreds of times? It's the Exodus. The Exodus in terms of the Hebrew scriptures is by far and away the dominant element. Uh, or theme of what God did on behalf of God's people. That's great. Again, the, the, that, that story, that the power you're saying, you know, the power of sure. stories to you know, make us talk about it, right? To think about it, to live it yeah. uh, in some way. Even yeah. when, when an Amos, when Amos is castigating the, the, the Northern Israelites in the eighth century BCE of their terrible sins, Amos chapter three, I'm speaking to the whole family that I brought out of the land of Egypt. He's digging it in, right? I did this for you, right? Yeah. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. It's hundreds and hundreds of times. It's an amazing kind of, uh, yeah. yeah. 
That's great. That's great. No, I really like that. So um, kind of weaving that back, and I think this is related, right? This this idea of stories, discussion of stories in a setting where that sort of discussion can, you know, questions, uh, mm -hmm. responses, disagreements can take place um, within a religious, you know, ritual setting. Um, you mentioned that uh, the, you know, post uh, temple, you know, after Rabbis, the destruction yeah. of the second temple um, in the first century, uh, or second century where you have Greco-Roman elements of uh, the this symposium. So maybe you can speak a bit to that, how that gets woven in there sure. and how that impacts, you know, what ends up being today the you know Jewish uh, Seder. Sure. So um so basically the 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 premise is the rabbi saying who is wise, he who can learn from every human being, right? So the enemies of the Jewish people in the first century were the Romans. Right, they they destroyed the land during several uprisings. They were terribly cruel, and yet the rabbis saw in this Greco-Roman custom of, you know, think of a book club. I'm going to get together, invite my friends into my house. Um, Jacob, I'm going to ask you to prepare the hors d'oeuvres. Uh, you know, Kara's there in the background saying, "I want you to to serve." You know, the dessert. I know you make up. I want you all to come together, and we're going to talk about this book. You know, we're going to we're going to have a discussion and oh, I know so and so plays the guitar. I'm going to have uh, them sing a song about it. Right. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're going to get to, we're going to have this wonderful experience together. And that that is a symposium. Now, the rabbis don't buy into it lock, stock and barrel. They create a Jewish or rabbinic version of that. But they 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 do. Um, they do. I think I'm losing the thread of your question. So forgive me. But they do kind of create a a vehicle that had not been known earlier than the second century to to express you know the religious observance that could no longer be done in the old way you said something else and it's popped out of my head right now um uh hmm i don't know it was there just a minute that's not ago. been worthwhile yeah <laughs> uh, well no don't say that it was very worthwhile and i wanted to say it <laughs> But um, the, the point the point is, is that, um, you know, we had to do something that would provide a continuity. The thing that was chosen was this Seder and the things that we do with the Seder. Right. The ways, you know, um, oh, I know I was going to say, again, the fact that we all tell stories differently. Right. Everybody has a different way of telling a story. Some of us through singing, some of us through discussion, and some of us would start it here and some of us would start it there. The Seder itself doesn't tell the story the way we typically do it in the West, right? How do we tell stories in the West? Once upon a time, they lived happily ever after. We tell a story linearly, right? First this happened, then this happened, then this happened. You can choose to do that at the Seder night, but if you open up a traditional Jewish Haggadah or guide to how do you do your own Seder at home, there's no story like that. There's dipping in and out. There's an interpretation here. There's a song there. There's a poem there. And these are all kind of talking points that ought to be done in an individually different, different way from household to household. So some of the elements are the same. There are four ritual questions that are asked you know, at the beginning, you know, the famous four questions. Um, uh, originally, by the way, there were three questions, but when the number three got very important in Christianity, the rabbis added a fourth. Um, so um, there's those kinds of things that 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 are, are, are institutional, right? Every, there's four cups of wine, right? Uh, you have to have four cups of wine at the Seder, but, you know, what do you do during the chanting and the talking and the telling is going to be different. From household to household, so I hope that yeah. answered your last question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, in in terms of yeah, to kind of taking a framework or pieces from a Greco-Roman uh, symposium setting and adapting Applying that it. or using that, yeah, sure, um, sure. as a window there. Um, again, so what? How significantly did that change from from what you understand? What was happening post? destruction of the second temple and how does it you know the, the, the obviously there are reverberations and how it's it's practiced today um are there different so you said you know it's going to be different different maybe uh, exactly where the cups are are, 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 are are you know drinking from at different points so right 
how uniform is that? Again, she said there's differences. What, what are some of the examples of some of those differences maybe to help people to understand? Because I think when Latter-day Saints think of, they think of, you know, the Jewish Passover or a mm. Jewish Seder service as being, again, like a monolithic, this is something that happens so they can refer to this tradition. So maybe highlighting just a, a, you know, a, a couple sure. interesting or the most important differences. Sure. The, um, uh, some of the, mate, look, from, the, from antiquity to the present, of course, the Jewish people has been exiled from east to west, from west back to east, you know, north to south, so that, uh, you know, I married a woman who is, uh, was born in Marrakesh. I was, it's that old, that old story, boy from Cleveland meets girl from Marrakesh. So when I, when I went to my in-laws, Seder, for the first team, first time I was, I was aghast, right? The things that they served at their Seder, we would have considered forbidden food, like rice and uh, legumes you know my grandparents wouldn't be caught dead with those kinds of things at our say at our seder because they were looked upon as well you could make bread out of them uh therefore they're they're like forbidden you know leavened products but my in-law said what are you talking about the other main difference was they had lamb we never would have lamb because we would never think of doing something that looked like a passover sacrifice so th there's those kinds of things but the other things are the the cultural things, the adaptations. Um, some of uh, the the chanting of the songs is done in Arabic in my in-laws' home, right? Whereas in my grandparents' home, it was done in Yiddish. Um, uh, there was no Yiddish sung in in Marrakesh. Let me tell you, right? Um, and um, those kinds of things gave a completely different flavor uh, to the experience. Of, of, of the Seder. Um, the texts are also different. If you were to, um, in a different context, Jacob, if we were doing the history of the Passover Haggadah, you know, the Haggadah being the guide to the Seder. Well, it wasn't published until the dawn of printing, right, in the 16th century, right? But between the second century, you know, when the Mishnah was starting to get written and the 16th century, you can tell that's over a thousand years. So wouldn't you know it, there are hundreds of versions of the Passover Seder, uh, hundreds of versions of the, um, the Haggadah. And some of them are illustrated, some of them are not. Some of them don't include passages that others do. You're, um, some of you have, who have been to a Seder know that one of the high points is where we sing Dai Dai Eno, right? Which is, it would have been enough for us. Do you know that song? You know, die, die, ain't no, every kid knows this. Die, die, ain't no, right? And we sing this. It would have been enough for us. Even if you didn't take us out of Egypt and given us the Sabbath, it would have been enough for us. Or if you given us the Sabbath, but not brought us to the land of Israel, it would have been us. We're so grateful for you, God, right? So I like to point out that, well, that Seder element, so crucial in the European Seder that my grandparents knew, was not known in Arabic speaking countries because it was written that that song was written in response to a uh, a Christian really anti-Semitic uh, chant that uh, the early church put together which is those ungrateful Jews I God sent them my son and he crucified they crucified him right they're not grateful they were never grateful about anything oh my gosh. So the Jews felt, this is terrible. First of all, we didn't do it. Second of all, we're, we've, we're so grateful to God. We'll write a response song, right? So in those Eastern Christian lands where that song was promulgated, Jews began a response ritual to that, that we call the Dayenu. In North Africa, they didn't know about that, right? So that's, that's one. Now, nowadays, by now, since the the books that have been printed over the last couple of years, everybody includes everybody else's custom. That's so, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so different differences, but there are certain core elements that are there absolutely in each of the different. But also it depends on, on the year. A, a thousand years ago, the core elements are fewer, mm. right, than they are now. You may know the story of Maxwell House, you know, the coffee manufacturer. Do you know this? Maxwell House discovered that Jews were hesitant to drink coffee on Passover because they were worried that it was not kosher for Passover. So Maxwell House as a coffee company had this great idea, we'll, we'll 
invite the rabbis into the factories. We'll demonstrate that it's just pure 100% coffee in our coffee, no secret leaven product, and we'll produce a Haggadah, which is called the Maxwell House Haggadah. I think it's one of the top selling books of all time. It's gone through like 30 or 40 editions. There are thousands and thousands of them in existence. Why am I telling the story? Ah, they took the text, the Hebrew text in the Maxwell House Haggadah from a famous German printing early in the 19th century, which by then had achieved a kind of a status as the most complete. That text is itself a combination of rites that are early and late, East and West, Arab, Yiddish, everything was stuck into that edition as, as though it were the most complete, and I like to say canonized text. So it wasn't until the coffee company canonized the Haggadah, right, that we have sort of today, Jews will say, what do you mean? It, it, it's in the Haggadah. It's like the, the book. And I say, yes, but where was it printed from? Good to the last drop, right? Um, it's a great story. You can look it up. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, um, let's let's transition to some of the audience questions here um, for okay, a while. You see them, I don't see them. So you, yes, correct. You, yeah, I yeah. will. I will. I will feed them to you uh, uh, in, a, in as kosher of a way as possible. Here. Absolutely. So let's uh, uh, have, have one question about maybe the symbolism of one of the elements of uh, the Passover. Uh, ritual in Exodus 12, uh, the lamb's unbroken bones. So, what are you know? So, so Jewish interpretation and maybe commentary on that you're aware of, of of why the lamb's bones were supposed to be unbroken. What was what was the interpretive? Uh, reason? I think the idea was that this particular offering was not was not butchered in any way, but it was put whole. The idea of it's sort of like the. Uh, the whole burnt offering um, that many of the ancestors in Genesis did, or a Leviticus chapter one, the idea of it's, when I say holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, excuse me, and the, um, but beyond that, it's not so significant. I know it becomes very significant uh, as, you know, Christ as the Paschal lamb and his experience um, at the crucifixion that his, lamb, that his limbs were not broken. That becomes an important Christian interpretive element, but not so much in Jews, Jewish ritual. What we have is what we call a shank bone, uh, a, a single bone off of a lamb that's roasted in an oven or on a barbecue and placed ritually on the Seder table, but it's just a piece. Um, that's, as, that's as much as we get. And that itself is symbolic of, of the foods that were eaten in antiquity. <laughs> Good, uh, helpful. Thank you. Um, I have another question uh, about again the text of Exodus twelve. Um, uh, the differences maybe in uh, maybe your know, interpretive reconciliation of God uh, being depicted as doing the killing of the firstborns or allowing the killing of the firstborns. And uh, this uh, audience member is pointing to Psalm uh, 78 that suggests that evil mess some sort of evil messengers did the killing, um, whereas Exodus 12 suggests that God is responsible there. So how is how is the Jewish community um, or Jewish interpreters, certain Jewish interpreters, how have they dealt with God's killing of the first one there? Look, uh, let's first of all be frank. It's a brutal story, right? It's a it's a brutal story. Stories of rescue and redemption, they don't usually happen like in a la-la land. There's unfortunately a lot of death and destruction. The, um, uh, the Entebbe rescue, it wasn't that, you know, you just flew in in 1976 and rescued the hostages. There was a battle, right? So uh, regretful loss of life. Exodus is very, very clear that God releases God's mashrit, that's the Hebrew word, uh, uh, God's destructive power. So Exodus ascribes this, not to any messengers, et cetera, but to God's own action. And any of those people who in Israel, uh, excuse me, who in Egypt had performed the sacrifice were spared, right? So that's the, the nation of, uh, of, of Israel and also the quote unquote mixed multitude, whoever among the Egyptians had decided they were gonna sign on with the Israelites experience and left together with them according to the evidence of the Bible. Um, so that um, uh, in Jewish tradition, almost always a text from the five books of Moses will be considered more authoritative than a Psalm. That's the short story. 
being that as it may, you ask, you ask for interpretations. And what's sort of humorous is that um, post, you know, post Talmudic, that is say, well into the Middle Ages, you start getting this idea of the angel of death, right? Just about the same time Christians, you know, developed the same kind of idea, the angel of death. We have that image of the fellow with the scythe and everything like that. And the angel of death went through the land of Egypt. So it didn't all happen around midnight all at once. It was as though he visited the homes again in a kind of linear fashion. It, the Bible doesn't depict it that way, but that mattered little in the medieval interpretation. And how do we know this? We see the artwork, right? We see the illustrated um, Haggadot that depict, right? an angel of death, or we have um, some of the most famous Passover songs that we sing at the end of the meal, uh, Chad Gadya, right? Which talk about the destruction of the angel of death and who beats the angel of death? God at the end of it uh, through redemption and resurrection. But um, uh, so that there, there does become probably a hint of not just Psalm 78, but all sorts of cultural influences that make people think of an angel doing the destructive act and not God. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, okay, that's, yeah, and I'm sure that, that, that conversation could be an entire... <laughs> well, we're, we're together, what, for six or seven hours tonight, correct? Yeah, right, right, so might as well just hash it out right now, because um, that's, yeah, that, that's, I think, a very rich, uh, yes, kind of, of tangent for, uh, you know, e ethical, moral, you know, how God is interacting there. Oh, yeah. To what degree is God involved in this, you know, pain, suffering, uh, and, and slaughter, right? So again, being this brutal slaughter of, uh, of innocence, right? These, these you know, in many cases, right, children, not just, you know, adults, children, that sort of yeah. thing. So uh, we'll have to save that conversation for another day. Um, um, looking at a few more questions here. Um, so I want to try to get a good range of, of questions that people are, are, are asking here. Um, one of them uh, is about uh, the... So a couple of these, one, one of these is uh, how do you, so I think maybe your, your feelings and maybe feelings of people of, of uh, people in the Jewish community that you interact with, uh, how do you feel about Christian groups, uh, per, you know, performing Seder uh, services themselves you know, right. who are not part of Look, the Jewish it's, community? It's, uh, uh, first of all, one of the great things about America is we don't have a government that tells us how we should observe our religion. Right. So that that Christian groups or anybody else wants to appropriate, you know, um, customs and traditions of other groups, that is their right to do it. And uh, far be it from me to say they should or they should not, because if they find it religiously moving as an American, I have to celebrate it. Um, sometimes I'm concerned that the, in the effort of America uh, to feel commonality we don't celebrate differences as much as perhaps we ought to. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't think there today can be a Jewish Christianity or Christian Judaism or Christian Hebraism in the sense of an actual practicing religion. Maybe 2000 years ago, things could have worked out differently, uh, but they didn't. So we've had basically a, 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 a buildup of 2000 years um, of of differentiation. And to be frank, most of the differentiation was done by Christians against Jews, right? Because Christians as an institution demonized Jews and persecuted Jews. Um, you know, the Jewish community of Northern Europe was destroyed by the church of Spain was destroyed by the inquisition. So, um, and obviously this goes through, you know, to the, um, the acquiescence of perfectly good religious Christians during the uh, World War II, during the Shoah, or the destruction of European Jewry. So on the one hand, on the one hand, what I feel would be a, a better, happier outcome would be for Christians who are interested in a Seder to get themselves invited to a Jewish household, right? But again, far be it from me to say Christians shouldn't do that, right? Uh, because uh, a Christian wanting to do that, to, to experience what Jesus would have experienced kind of thing. Um, I'm not going to tell that person not to do it. I would like to say from a historical point of view, 
people often ask me, was the Last Supper a Seder? And I said, I would say, no, it could not have been because of what we said earlier. Jesus lived in the first century CE, right? The temple still stood. The Seder as an institution dates from the, you know, the second century CE. The Seder and the rabbinic institution that we've created and discussed most of this evening is a post Jesus experience. So Jesus had a sacred meal with his followers uh, before he was arrested and etc. But it wasn't a Seder per se. It was a Passover celebration. However, they did it. But uh, I think that, that that's uh, that's a very helpful answer. I think, and so for yeah, for audience members, I think that's that's popular in some places, even within like the Latter Day Saint community, it's a Christian community, a fascination with. The, uh, it's here in New York too. Yeah, I have we yeah. have students at the seminary, uh, Christian students who come to study Hebrew scriptures at at the Jewish Theological Seminary where I teach. I know that they do seders. They tell me about it. I I just smile and say, you know, Baruch Hashem, praise God, right? I, I'm not going to tell them how to observe yeah. their religion. I would yeah. never do that to someone. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, okay, here's another question. So uh, just kind of a quick, by way of super short background for you, um, Rabbi Harris, the, um, in the Latter-day Saint tradition, the figure of Elijah, um, you know, Elijah's turn, you know, return before, you know, the great and dreadful day of the Lord um, is, is, is significant. And Elijah is seen as a significant figure who Latter-day Saints have seen in, in, in Latter-day Saint tradition, um, Elijah did return and visited uh, the uh, first uh, prophet of our tradition, Joseph Smith. Um, and so there's, you know, that, that's, that's providing certain authority, you know, certain uh, you know, permission to act and, and uh, for God in certain ways, specifically with kind of binding the human family uh, together, right? Uh, parents to children across, you know, centuries, um, ages, and so that 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 that's a really important figure uh, theologically for uh, Latter Day Saints. And so there's a fascination with, uh, you know, Jewish seder services uh, where there's a place set for Elijah. Um, could you just give, maybe give us a quick sure. how how that, how that got to be part of that uh, so here's, seder here's, service? He comes in from two different directions. I'll, I'll keep it as brief as I can. I mentioned earlier that originally there were three cups of wine at the Seder, and that was later changed to four. To justify that, that fourth cup, they used an interpretive tradition based on the language of redemption in Exodus chapter three, right? And they said there were four verbs, er, ergo we should have four cups of wine. But there were actually five verbs in the next verse. And so one group of rabbis said, we should have four cups of wine. And another one said, no, 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 we should have five. And they duke that out in the Talmud and they're not able to come to a resolution. So because of the verse in Malachi uh, chapter three, verses 24 to 26, that you mentioned before, it mentions that Elijah's function is to reconcile parents with children. That's what scripture says. The rabbis understand that metaphorically to mean he'll help to reconcile between Dispute, disputing groups of rabbis who can't come to an agreeable discussion. So they say, well, if one group says five and one group says four, they agree about four. They disagree about the fifth cup. So the resolution was drink four, pour five, leave it on the table. And when Elijah comes to uh, before the Messiah comes uh, to help us reconcile between dispute and religious groups of rabbis, we'll know whether or not we should drink that fifth cup. That's how it becomes known as Elijah's cup. Now, in fact, there's another more popular reason why Elijah is there. Elijah is evoked in Jewish ritual primarily in three times of great danger. And since he was supposed to be the harbinger of the Messiah, note that in Christian tradition, the book of Malachi comes right before the book of Matthew, right? So that, G that Elijah becomes a John the Baptist-like figure uh, to the Messiah as John was to Jesus, right? But he, he's not there in our tradition. He's stuck back in the, the books of the prophets. So what was he doing for us since then? And the, the popular answer, not justified by a text, was that he protects us. So at three very precious and dangerous moments, we evoke Elijah. One of those is at the Brit Milah, the circumcision of a child. Child's eight day, he's circumcised. Oh my gosh, we're inflicting a wound on him. There's blood loss. 
oh my gosh, we're so worried. We set a place for Elijah, so Elijah will protect the young one. Again, it's just a real, it's a ritual. Another one is on the Sabbath. Well, on the Sabbath, we have our souls, right? We live, ah, but on the Sabbath, since it's a taste of the world to come, we get a second soul, right? And that's why the Sabbath is so beautiful and, 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 and joyous. But God takes that second soul on Saturday night at the end of the Sabbath. Oh, if God takes a second soul, he's taken it away. Maybe we're going to die. Oh, no, we'll evoke Elijah. That's why as we light the first candle at the end of the Sabbath, we evoke Elijah again. So too at the Passover Seder, because the Passover Seder was a time of great danger to the Jewish people. Since, because Easter and Passover often come around, even if they don't happen on the same day, they happen at springtime. And you know the history of, of Christian understanding of the crucifixion is that the Jews got blamed for that. So the, it was a, a typically a time of pogroms and attacks on the Jewish community. And it was for that reason we evoke Elijah for protection against Christians who were coming to kill us uh, with, with false accusations about kidnapping Christian children. And there's, it's just, there's some horrific stuff. Last year, I don't know if you got this in your library, um, there was this just amazing illustrated Passover Haggadah that was done by the church in the Middle Ages, prepared by uh, a monk who knew Hebrew excellently. He wasn't a convert either. He was, he, he was a Christian Hebraist. And he translated the Hebrew and Aramaic sections of the Seder line by line into Latin. But then in a really perfidious way, he said, here in Latin, it's here the Jews take the Christian child that they have kidnapped slaughter him and drink his blood as though he's really representing what the Haggadah says. It is horrific, but there it's, it's from the 14th century. I think it's just testimony to what all religions experience at some point or another, hate of the other, hatred of the other. You and I were talking about the way uh, uh, the Mormon church in this country has often been vilified by the majority. People don't understand there's difference. One unfortunate reaction of people is to hate. So Elijah was evoked at that time to say, protect us. That's great. I think that's a good, I think a good way to kind of end our conversation here is this, this, this real redemption protection, uh, uh, you know, the God kind of infusing something into a community, some sort of uh, you know, you know, benefit uh, is, is God, God is looking, God is aware. God is 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 act, is helping us out of positions of being persecuted, right? And sure. the importance of of kind of you know remembering the experience that God has done that in in our lives in our different communities, certainly in, in different uh, horrific ways for the Jewish community, in different uh, horrific ways with the Latter Day Saint community. Um, but that this idea that God is still involved, and that one of the things that we do when we gather together as a community is to celebrate. The redemption of our different communities through the instrumentality of God, um, that that's the beautiful and inspiring. Yeah, yeah, and that we yeah. should, and likewise, you know, that that we you were mentioning this earlier, that we should also put it, being seeing ourselves as slave as slaves in the land of Israel or as experiencing this persecution to be even more mindful of other people in our communities. That are experiencing persecution, sure. hardship, and that we have a you know, an, a you know moral religious obligation to put ourselves Experience in their place and like, to help them in there. Yes, through yeah, through the way. Ways. Yes, so, absolutely. Good. Great. Okay. Great. Well, thank thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Harris, for the time here this evening. I feel like we could keep going for, like you said, six, seven more hours. Um, well, but not. unfortunately, yeah, you are on the East Coast, and it's pretty late over there. So thank you for taking the time to, to discuss with pleasure, this. With pleasure. And let, let me just close by saying I, I, I pray for God's protection of every vulnerable human being, you know, out there and uh, that God should give us the strength to do God's work in doing the protection. So yes, yes. Uh, let's, uh, let's hope for the best. Great. Yeah. So thank you for those of you who are watching at home. Thank you uh, for joining us for this Come Follow Me interfaith conversation with uh, Rabbi Harris here. As I mentioned earlier, you can rewatch this entire conversation if you missed something or you want to you know, just 
kind of bask in Rabbi Harris's uh, personality and or any of his answers, uh, you can do oh, so sure. by uh, visiting uh, widsofoundation.org. Um, and as a reminder, the Witso Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit um, and is entirely funded by our generous audience members. So if you find what we're doing here, uh, what we discussed tonight, um, and with this series valuable, please consider making a tax deductible donation at widsofoundation.org uh, forward slash donate. Um, and thank you for coming here. Our, our next conversation is going to be uh, discussing uh, Israel at Sinai and the Ten Commandments. Um, and so we're looking forward to that conversation. Again, thank you, Rabbi Harris, for joining us this evening. My um, pleasure. I hope everyone has a good evening, day, wherever it is uh, you are. Um, and please be safe. Thank you. Be safe and be healthy.